clients like to always begin with a prayer. So we have um, Rabbi Rachel Heaps from Temple Jeremiah to start the evening off for us. O oh God of many names, open our eyes to the sacred responsibility of caring for every piece of your infinitely diverse creation, for those who are near as well as the, for those who are further away. Help us to see with eyes of curiosity those whose language, skin, and culture might differ from our own. Give us the strength to reach out our hands to those whom we have not yet met and embrace them with the promise of friendship. O oh God, we know that the world you created was not made inherent with guarded borders or impossible boundaries. In the times of our ancestors and of today, we know that there are those who travel far and wide under your guidance and protection. We also know that our own human influence has made it more difficult, more perilous, and more necessary than ever before. Every day, vulnerable strangers arrive in foreign lands looking for shelter and sustenance. Help us to become tools of your divine compassion and welcome. O oh God, help us to recognize that the foundation of the dignity of the members of the human family is the cause of freedom, justice, and peace. May we find strength to protect and plead the cause of the stranger among us, to ensure just treatment for all who dwell in our land. Help us to welcome those who cross our borders today. Give us hearts of compassion, communities of conviction, and laws of respect and dignity for all immigrants. Empower us to be instruments of justice for all, for in the wholeness of humanity we find holy purpose. May our purpose today and every day be one of acceptance and embracing. O oh God, help us to use what we hear this evening to see one another through eyes enlightened by understanding and compassion. May each of us be reminded of our sacred and civic duty to create a just society right here, right now, in our day. Fight off the easy call of complacency as we protect and welcome the strangers in our midst and as we undertake the hallowed opportunity of turning strangers into friends. O oh God, may this be your will as well as ours, and let us say, Amen. Amen. Thank you. It always brings so much peace when you start off with um, scripture. So thank you, Rachel. Rabbi Rachel. Assalamu alaikum, peace, and shalom. My name is Bill Nazwaraj, and I'm the Vice President of the Nutrier Multi Faith Alliance. I welcome you here tonight, this Thursday evening, as we discuss welcoming the stranger, what do the sacred texts teach, what are we doing about it? So I'm gonna first ask everyone, does everyone have a booklet? If you don't, I know we have uh, Mary back there passing them out. And I have to say thank you to uh, Mr. Thomas Murphy and Mr. Waldick, if you don't mind standing up. Uh, they put our booklet together every year and it's a piece of um, art and please save it and take it home. So the Nutria Multi-Faith um, Alliance has been around for 51 years. A year and a half ago, we changed our name to the um, Nutria Multi-Faith Alliance from the Winnetka Interfaith Council. And the reason we changed the name, but making sure that our mission is still strong, is to include the geographical locations of where the houses of worship are, as well as being more of a ecumenical um, discussion-based or organization. Within our uh, Nutria Multi-Faith Alliance, we have a subcommittee. The subcommittee is the um, Interfaith Understanding. So our yeah. under Interfaith Understanding Committee, this is the fourth one um, of series of dialogues we've put together. And this dialogue of um, welcoming the stranger, what do the sacred texts teach, today is a very timely topic. It's a topic that we've been discussing in politics, in our homes, in our houses of worship, and we would like you to walk away today with a four-prong approach so you have discussions and meaty ideas for you to have with your friends and your neighbors and your uh, co-workers. Four ideas we'd like you to walk away with is number one, we want to make sure that this um, discussion today is piquing your interest about the stranger. Number two, 
We want to make sure that you've got questions that are being stimulated about the stranger. We want to make sure that our guests today have knowledge and language to have discussions about the stranger. And lastly, we want to make sure we move our conversation not from tolerance about our faith, but from an understanding about our faith and what and who the stranger is. So before we have this discussion, I'd really like all of you just to take a minute. We're all just going to close our eyes. So we're just going to take a minute, close our eyes. And when you think about welcoming the stranger, what does the stranger look like? What race, what socioeconomic level, what faith is the stranger coming from? How did that stranger become a stranger? What political policies placed that stranger in that policy hold? Why is the stranger a stranger? So go ahead and open your eyes. So the Nutria Multi-Faith Alliance is definitely an ecumenical organization, and we want to make sure we're respectful to the various faiths. So we have Muslim, Baha'i, um, Jewish, uh, um, Christian panelists here, and we're very fortunate to have um, a discussion moderator, Jerome McDonald from WBEZ. And on Tuesday, Jerome um, had a discussion about this topic at, on Worldview at 12, 15, 12 25. 1225, so you can go back to your WBEZ app, which I'm sure you all have. So go on to your smartphones and download the WBEZ app, and make sure you listen to the um, introduction to this timely topic um, from Tuesday. And then um, thank you so much, Jerome, for having us on on Tuesday, and thank you for being here and being our moderator. We have four panelists that have worked really hard to put their thoughts together and understand where our faith is coming from by understanding the stranger. So I welcome all of you. I welcome you to definitely have, um, you have index cards. So on your index cards, do you guys have index cards? Yes. Okay, great. You have index cards and pens. So put your questions on the index cards and um, make sure you pass them out uh, to the person collecting them towards the end of the evening. The other thing is we do have a videographer and a um, photographer. So pictures and the audio of this event will be on our website. The website is NTMA alliance.org and um, you will be able to hear this and share it with your family on a later date. So I will give it to Jerome McDonald. Thank you. Thanks, Del Naz. And I think it's a great idea to do this. I salute the Nutrier Multi-Faith Alliance for doing this because uh, particularly about the topic of immigration and, and refugees, I, I think we can all um, are probably a little um, frustrated about what's going on in the, in the country and even within our congregations can feel a little bunkered and hunkered down and isolated and when we all get together and we share our values and we think things through I think we'll feel better I think we'll feel stronger and get a get a real boost from this conversation tonight uh, the we were flying some emails around about the tonight's panel and um, everybody was getting their stuff in order, and I wondered if I was going to remain faithless tonight or not. Or should I have a faith? And and Donna says, "Sure, say, yeah, do your thing." And she she doesn't know what faith I am yet. <laughs> um, I grew up Catholic, uh, and my uh, wife and I both grew up Catholic. But ten years ago, we started going to a Unitarian congregation in Palatine, and uh, we've really enjoyed it, and it's been terrific. It's really. Uh, pretty different than the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is uh, kind of a, uh, <laughs> I knew that was a laugh line. I'm glad you guys got it. Um, uh, so, you know, top down and a little more. Uh, you know, they believe there are many paths to God, and you don't even have to believe in God to come to the uh, Unitarian Church. So it's, um, it's interesting. So we don't have a text. We don't have a holy book. We've got, some, um, we've got seven different uh, values, that we, principles that we have. And I think if you walked up and asked the people in our congregation to name the seven principles, they would be hard pressed to name the seven principles. They can probably name the first one pretty good, because everybody likes the first one. Um, the first one is uh, we believe in the uh, worth and dignity of every person. 
it's pretty simple, it's pretty straightforward, it gets right to the meat of things, and I think it gets to some of the things we're going to be talking about tonight. If you believe in the worth and dignity of every person, and you emphasize that, um, things get pretty clear when it comes to uh, welcoming the stranger. Uh, there's another principle which is pretty solid, it's principle number two, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Well, I can, I can get behind that. And I think when it comes to welcoming the stranger, um, you cannot do an injustice to another person. And uh, if you believe they have worth and dignity, you, you've got to treat them right. Um, our seventh principle, I'll skip down to seven, uh, is respect for the interdependent web of all existence which, which we are a part. And Unitarians apply this to nature a lot. They really dig their nature in the Unitarian Church. and. Um, but I apply it to everybody, everything. It's about people, too. It's about the other. It's about our, our universe. Uh, we've got to respect the whole connectedness and recognize the whole connectedness of all of us. Um, so the Unitarian Church I go to, we tend to focus a lot of our attention on, on a few different causes. One of them is the Interfaith Committee for Detained Immigrants. And uh, it's a terrific organization. The executive director, my co-congregant, and my neighbor, Melanie Shakori, is here in the front row. And I'm going to have her say just a few words about the organization. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, so the Interfaith Community for Detained Immigrants is an organization made up of mostly volunteers, over 300 volunteers, a very small staff. And what we do is we intersect with the broken immigration system in all different places. We visit detention centers. We visit the unaccompanied children who are in centers here. We go to immigration court. We have a post-detention release program, which is a hotline people can call to get help when they're released. And we have houses of hospitality for people that don't have somewhere to stay when they're seeking asylum and their case isn't done yet and they don't speak the language. So if you want to know more about it, I will be here afterwards. Was started by two Catholic nuns, and they they passed a bill so that they could give pastoral care to the detained immigrants ten years ago with a bunch of other groups. It's pretty cool. Um, we'll get on with the regular part of the program. Uh, thank you for listening to my Unitarian spiel. <laughs> um, our our first speaker is uh, from the Jewish faith, and her name's Jennifer Gong Gershowitz. And um, we have a little thing in our, in our programs about her. <laughs> You're director of the immigration law practice at Highland Park Highwood Legal Aid Clinic. And uh, you, you can take it from there. Hi, everyone. Um, maybe it's easier if I stand. I, I'm short, so I feel like when I'm sitting, I can't see everyone. Hello. Um, Thank you, uh, Jerome. Um, uh, I am Jennifer Gong Gershowitz, and um, I'm a member of Temple Jeremiah. Um, I am Jewish, and I am also the granddaughter of Chinese immigrants. Um, I am a human rights attorney with over 20 years of experience representing uh, the stranger. And um, my perspective on these issues um, has been influenced by three things. My family, my faith, and also my profession. Um, Jewish values of welcoming the stranger are foundational and inform the context in which I view my own family's immigration experience, my advocacy on behalf of immigrants and refugees, and now my policy platform as the Democratic nominee for the 17th uh, House of Representatives seat um, in the Illinois legislature. Um, a little bit about me and my background. Um, as I mentioned, I am the granddaughter of Chinese immigrants on my father's side of the family. Um, and I discovered when I was in law school that my grandparents uh, themselves had faced deportation under the Chinese Exclusion Acts, which uh, made all immigration from China illegal until 1943, based solely on race and nationality. Um, I learned when I was in law school that there was a civil rights attorney by the name of Irv Goodman. Um, who championed my grandparents' case challenging the constitutionality of race-based immigration laws for over 10 years. 
So you uh, fast forward, you know, a little bit to uh, the kinds of issues that we are debating today. Um, and um, at least from my personal perspective, it's disheartening to see us once again um, debating whether or not we should, as a country, um, have immigration laws um, that are, in my opinion, um, race, nationality, or even religion uh, based. Um, so that's a little bit of context from my personal perspective. My professional uh, life has also been centered around these issues predominantly for the last 20 years. I started my career at a large law firm called Winston and Strawn in 1996 when I graduated from Loyola Law School. And because of my family's history, I was interested in doing pro bono work um, in immigration. And I partnered with the National uh, Immigrant Justice Center um, and took on a case involving a nine-year-old child who was a victim of child sex trafficking. And at that time, there was no precedent for um, child trafficking as a grounds for persecution in the United States. And we also had no procedures for protecting unaccompanied immigrant children from being re-traumatized in the immigration process. Um, the child traffickers had hired attorneys to represent the child to get her out of custody um, because she was supposed to be delivered to a 40-year-old man living in Atlanta. I had no standing to interject in the case, um, so I pioneered the use of pro bono social workers to serve as guardians ad litem. Um, I sort of created a mechanism uh, with which to um, uh, procedurally um, have somebody looking out for the child's best interests. And then after the conclusion of that case, where I was able to establish child trafficking as a grounds for persecution, um, I co-founded the Illinois Unaccompanied Children's Task Force with the National Immigrant Justice Center, uh, brought law enforcement advocates, um, immigration advocates, and others together to work on systemic changes to our immigration system. Um, I then went on um, to be the first American lawyer to earn a master's in international human rights law and I published on gendered war crimes. Um, and then most recently built the immigration practice at a nonprofit legal aid clinic uh, here in our community to represent um, immigrants um, in our community um, who have been impacted by um, the policies of the current administration. And we could talk a lot about that. There has been much change um, in the course of the last year three uh, executive orders on interior immigration in the first month of the Trump administration alone um, that have radically changed the landscape for immigrants in this country. And I think all of you here are probably well aware of that and be anxious to talk about that. But now um, to the Jewish perspective. Um, the Torah and its commentators um, uh, you know, uh, are filled um, with commands in the positive to love, and in the negative, to not mistreat or oppress the stranger. And I think if you look at your um, your booklets, you'll see um, an excerpt from Exodus, um, from the Torah, uh, that says, you shall not wrong a stranger or, or oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So a command in the negative, not to harm. And then from Leviticus, thou shalt love the stranger, the stranger that sojourneth with you shall be unto you as the home born among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. Which is a positive, a to do. So, you know, the Torah, you know, commands both action to love and also not to harm or oppress. And um, I view this as an affirmative responsibility to do more than not just not harm, but to actually to love, which is, you know, if you think about the word love, you know, what what that means, and, and um, that has informed um, my career, um, my perspective um, as somebody who represents immigrants and refugees, um, and it also is consistent with international law, which recognize these foundational principles that have been enshrined in international treaties, um, the Refugee Convention in particular, um, which the United States is a signatory to, which is consistent with Jewish values. Um, the principle of non-refoulement uh, is the cornerstone of asylum and international refugee law. Again, requiring, affirmatively requiring um, nations 
to provide refuge to those who cannot safely return home. So there are affirmative um, uh, you know, responsibilities that come um, you know, and are consistent with um, my faith. Um, and you know, I have uh, spoken on this issue many times, and I, I will not pretend to be an expert on uh, Jewish scripture. I will leave that to our rabbi. Um, but I do know that um, Judaism is unequivocal on this issue, in my view. Um, that in terms of whether or not um, we as a nation or we as human beings have a responsibility to the stranger, I think that from the Jewish perspective is an unequivocal yes. Um, and so I look forward to uh, having a conversation with all of you and um, uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'll save you that um, from not having to pronounce my name. Um, but if you can't pronounce, if you look at, at the booklet, it says it in Nida Rendon. Um, if you can't pronounce that, you can just call me Ere, which is much simpler. Um, so uh, I'm a little bit nervous speaking to you all today. Um, not because you all make me nervous, but because my colleague allowed us here and we have this friendly competition as to who's a better speaker. Um, so <laughs> she kind of looks like me and um, she has similar stories. So. Um, but I think uh, I'll, try to, I'll try to do her justice today. Uh, so I um, am an undocumented immigrant. I have DACA, um, so Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, and um, I will have it until November of this year, although because of the current injunction, as you may all know, um, we're able to reapply for renewal, at least for the time being. And so I'm hoping that I have it for a little bit longer and continue to be protected from deportation and can continue to work. Um, I was born in the most beautiful state in all of Mexico, um, Oaxaca, and uh, definitely the most delicious. Um, and I came to the U.S. Uh, at four, when I was four and a half years old. Um, so my dad came to the U.S. when he was eight months. Um, and um, he came because he was supposed to work for two years. He was supposed to send money home. We were supposed to build our house. Uh, he was supposed to move home. Uh, and uh, we were supposed to live happily ever after, um, but it didn't happen. Uh, so after four years, my mom said, you have to send for us or you have to come home. Uh, so he sent for us. Uh, and the reason why I chose uh, the scriptures that you all have in front of you um, is because um, it's actually focused on the immigrant versus um, the folks, uh, versus on the folks welcoming them, right? So it's, um, and you know, so faith is assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For, for by it, the men of, of old gained approval. By faith, Abraham, who, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise. Um, and I think that my mom. Um, when she decided that we were going to come to the U.S., right, she had absolutely no idea what she was going to come to, and she had to have extreme faith and extreme hope to be able to think that the life that she was going to be able to provide for her children was going to be better in the U.S. than it was going to be in Oaxaca. Um, I grew up in a small town called Harvard, Illinois, um, so we went directly to Harvard. Um, my parents, <laughs> yeah, and I graduated there. I'm a Harvard graduate. Um, and so, uh, and so um, when, we, uh, when we got there, uh, my mom says that it was that her faith was definitely tested because she was like, what did I bring my children to, right? So we went where my dad was living. It was a two bedroom apartment with about 15 other men. Um, and they were kind enough to give us one of the bedrooms. Um, and so it was my mom, my brother, my dad, um, and me in one room, and you know, 15 men in another room and in the living room. And um, she was like, you know, like definitely shocked. She didn't know uh, that, um, she did think that this was the promised land, right? She didn't know that that's what she was gonna bring her children to. Uh, they were able to finally save enough, a little bit of money to be able to buy a traila, so a little mobile home, and they bought the smallest mobile home in the mobile home complex. Um, and we moved there, and this was like six months later after arriving in the U.S., and my dad was deported. Uh, so my dad was trying to adjust his status through his uh, employer, uh, and I don't really know what happened, um, but he was, at one time when he either had to go to court or something, he just didn't come home. Um, so uh, because we were all here, my dad, my dad came back. 
Um, and uh, we moved to Wisconsin for a couple of years. Um, and then once we were able to, um, once my parents saved enough money to buy a house, um, we moved back to Harvard. Um, and, um, and, and that's where I grew up. I grew up like every other undocumented person, um, really student who at the time, I knew that I was undocumented. I always knew that I was undocumented. Um, and, I, and I think that I knew this because when I was nine years old, my mom wanted me to uh, meet my family again, who I was forgetting in Oaxaca, and so she sent me home. And I went um, with my cousin's birth certificate, and it used to be a lot easier. Um, and so she would sit me down, and I would write her name over and over again, like Saira La Variega, Saira La Variega, Saira so that I could remember how to spell what was going to be my name when I came back to the US. Um, and ever since that moment, I think I always knew that I was supposed to be fearful of my status, and I always knew I was different, and I always knew that there was going to be some challenges. But you don't really know exactly what those challenges are until you start growing up. And you're 15, and you're sitting in, um, you know, sitting in my driver's ed class and knowing that I was exactly like every other student, but I wasn't going to be able to get my driver's license at the end of it. Um, and when I had to take my PSATs and I got my results and it dawned on me that maybe I wasn't going to be able to go to college. And I always wanted to go away to college because in Saved by the Bell they went away to college and they all lived together in an apartment and it looked like a lot of fun. Um, and I really wanted to do that. Um, and um, luckily, um, and maybe it's not even luckily, but because of organizations like where I work, the Resurrection Project and um, different coalitions, we had, they had passed what's called the in-state tuition bill and it allows undocumented students in the state of Illinois to go to school and pay uh, in-state tuition. And we have the student access bill, so I'm glad that we're sitting next to each other, um, because we can <laughs> make it so that we can apply for scholarships as well in the future, because right now we're not eligible. Um, so uh, my mom is a hustler and like worked um, like crazy to be able to pay for my entire four years of school. Um, and after graduating, I moved to Chicago to work um, around these issues. Um, and I also think that so, well, one is um, now that I, uh, now that I'm getting a little older, right, I'm 32, um, I started thinking about kind of when my mom turned 60, um, a lot more about, I always thought it was really hard to be 16 and be undocumented and then be in college and be undocumented and then I realized it's worse to be an adult and be undocumented and I can't believe my parents have done this for over 30 years and now I realize that it's the absolute worst to start aging and be undocumented um, because my mom doesn't have health insurance because my mom's not going to get social security because my mom doesn't have that much savings and because there's going to be a moment where we're going to decide whether she will can stay here forever and I don't think that that's uh, going to actually happen. Like I think there's going to be a day where we decide that my parents go back to Mexico. Um, and because I can't go and because they can't come back, um, I think that my new reality is realizing that that may be the last time that I ever see my parents. Um, so that's uh, kind of like my new thing that I've been thinking about in terms of the, uh, you know, trying to go back to this place of that we, I have to have faith in order to be able to think that they, that, that might not happen. Um, and that maybe, even if they move back, that maybe I'll have my status and I'll be able to see my parents again. Um, and I think, you know, and, and a lot of it has to do with um, the second reading, right, is about um, doing deeds. Um, and I think that that also has to do with not just welcoming the stranger and not just saying, like, yes, I believe that. Um, undocumented immigrants can be here that we should welcome them but actually having policy that changes the lives and improves the quality of life that we have right um, I mentioned not being able to get a driver's license when I was 16 but now all undocumented immigrants in the state of Illinois can get driver's licenses because we passed this bill in 2013 the temporary visitors driver's license and now thank God right my oldest brother and my both my parents are one of 300,000 people in Illinois that have driver's licenses. We have the opportunity to help people uh, apply for DACA um, to continue to protect them from deportation the way that I am protected. Um, one day we will pass the DREAM Act and you know, and hopefully you all join, we're all very active in trying to pass that. Um, and um, you know, at, at the state level, what I realize now that will keep my parents here um, is access to health care and affordable health care. And, and we do it for 
just children in Illinois, undocumented children have received all kids, and it's time that we start thinking about the older population of undocumented immigrants, because we're actually not getting any younger. Um, none of us are, right? And so, um, and, and there's not that many undocumented people coming in right now, so what's happening is that the undocumented folks that are here, um, we're, we're starting to you know, get older, and even folks like me who you know, were considered, uh, I came in at the age of four, I'm 32, right? So my reality changes um, just like everybody else's does when our ages change. Uh, so, um, so as I think about um, kind of what's next um, in, the, in, in our world, right? Um, it's making sure uh, that we're trying to pass um, laws at the state level and the local level that protect and make the lives of immigrants better while we keep our eye on making sure that one day we'll be able to pass legalization so that I can see my mom um, as time goes by. This is Suzanne Akrasalul, and um, she's an old friend of mine. I knew her for many years in the Syrian American community. She worked with the Syrian American Medical Society with her husband for many years, uh, supplying uh, medical help for refugees and for Syrians. And uh, she has founded and is the executive director of the Syrian Community Network. For the last few years, they've been welcoming uh, Syrian refugees and helping them resettle in our community. And it's great to see you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Dilnaz, for organizing. And thank you, Jerome, for being here. And for all of you for taking time out of your Thursday evening to be here and to hear our stories. Um, uh, thank you uh, to my fellow panelists as well. Um, as Jerome mentioned, uh, I'm the founder and executive director of the Syrian Community Network, a refugee support organization that's based uh, in Edgewater, uh, not very far from here. Uh, we started the organization in 2015, um, and we now have chapters uh, in San Diego, Phoenix, Atlanta, and as well as Chicago as the base uh, of the organization, so we're really proud of that. Um, so the idea is to replicate the model in other cities um, uh, of welcoming refugees and welcoming the stranger. Um, my whole life, uh, I felt, I've always felt like a stranger. Um, I've, uh, I was born and raised in, in Syria for the, for the first 10 years, and uh, I grew up in, in Syria having a Canadian mother and a Syrian father. So my dad came to, uh, the, to Chicago in the 1960s and to study engineering. Um, and at that time, we welcomed immigrants, and especially you know the educated immigrants who were coming in here to uh, get their degrees. And um, and so he met my mother here in Chicago, and um, I was, uh, as I mentioned, I was born in Syria. So, but when you grow up in Syria, having um, uh, an American, you know, they didn't say Canadian; they said an American mom. So you always feel like you're, you're, you know, you kind of don't belong. You know, like you, you know, you're, everybody's mom is Syrian. Everybody's mom and dad is, you know, are the same, but except us, our, our family, you know. Uh, and then when we came here to Chicago, also, uh, it was still strange, you know, you're, you have an American mom and a, a, and a Syrian dad, so you were always kind of like, you kind of don't fit in exactly. But, uh, but in hindsight, that's a good thing because I grew up uh, in a community with uh, people from diverse backgrounds, with Palestinians, with um, uh, uh, East, Southeast Asians, with uh, Egyptians, with uh, African, -American, African Americans. My best friend in high school was African American, so it was, it was a good thing uh, in, in hindsight to, to be different uh, all the time. Um, and so I think that's kind of what helped me um, you know, focus on community work, um, serving uh, uh, my community. Uh, there, I was sharing with Jerome how a lot of things that I did in my past um, with the Muslim community um, helped, uh, you know, helped me now with my organization. So I was part of a committee that started a food pantry in 2004 in, in, in the Bridgeview area with the Mosque Foundation. And now my board was talking about, well, well, maybe we need to start a food pantry. How do we start a food pantry? I'm like, oh, I know how to start a food pantry. I did that before, even though I wasn't very active in the committee. But I just sometimes being in a, in a committee or sitting on a board and listening you absorb a lot of the information and then you don't know when you, you're going to use that information later on in life. 
Um, so that's a good thing. And I also, um, a few, uh, some of the work that my husband and I were involved with the immigration um, work from 2004 and 2005, I remember attending a lot of the rallies, and now I'm invo heavily involved with uh, with Aries group, uh, the Protected by Faith for uh, undocumented and, and um, you know, people who are in DACA. So it's, for me, it's a lot of the things that I've done uh, that uh, are, were inspired by my faith are um, now I'm finding the results and the fruits of my labor um, and of those values um, in, in this work, in, in the field of welcoming refugees and working with people who are undocumented and um, you know, supporting the people who are in DACA. Um, uh, and also, I, I remember my husband and I going to one of the detention centers and protesting uh, about fair and equal treatment of people who are detained. And now I just joined the board <laughs> of um, the Illinois Community Detained Immigrants. So I'm very proud to be uh, to announce that I've joined this board. And Melanie, who's here, the executive director. Um, so again, it's it's all fun, you know, just coming together very nicely. And I chose the verses uh, from the Quran. Um, uh, when Danaz asked me, I said, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not very religious, so I, I'll admit that. So, um, I, but I, I, right away, the two verses that came to my, to my mind are those who believed uh, immigrated and sacrificed their wealth and lives in the cause of God, and those who provided them with shelter and supported them are the best of allies. So, um, you know, as a Muslim, um, one of the, the stories that you learn as, uh, as a child uh, about the life of the Prophet when, um, when uh, Islam was first revealed to him, and one of the stories is that um, the Prophet Muhammad sent some of his companions, the early companions who were being persecuted, to uh, Abyssinia, what is modern day uh, Ethiopia. And in Abyssinia, there was a Christian king who welcomed the people, the refugees, the Muslim refugees who went there to seek refuge, to seek safety. And the second story that we always um, you know, learned uh, is the migration uh, of uh, the Muslims from Mecca to Medina, where they became, became refugees and sought refuge in Medina because they were being persecuted in Mecca. Um, and uh, one of the very last people to leave Mecca was the Prof Prophet Muhammad, because as a leader, you are the one who is supposed to leave last, not the first, to ensure the safety of your, of your community. And when he arrived, you know, he was greeted by uh, people who were chanting and very happy to see him. And the very first, one of the very first things that he did was uh, create a program called Mu'akha. Mu'akha means brotherhood or a joining of people. So you, they brought people from Medina and they paired them up with people from Mecca so that the people in Medina can teach the people from Mecca, the new, the new refugees who arrived uh, about life in Mecca, how, to help them in their adjustment, to help them, to show them where the market is, to um, you know, share in, in their bounty. And so we created a program uh, with Syrian Community Network called the Mentorship Program and where we pair people, um, Chicagoans just like you, uh, who want to help um, with uh, uh, refugees who have just arrived to Chicago because they need a lot of help and need a lot of uh, warm welcome uh, from a community uh, that, that is so willing to help. Um, one of the things that happened to us is um, with the, uh, what was happening in Syria, a lot of people started seeing those images and when the image of little Ailan Kurdi um, showed up and went viral uh, on TV, and, um, and you know that little boy that's laying on the beach, he was drowned, and a lot of people started asking, how can we help, what can we do? And we, we had just started the organization, and we really didn't know how to direct people how to help. You know, you can manage, when you're a volunteer board, you can manage maybe a few volunteers, but then when you have 70 um, volunteer applications, you really don't know how to direct people anymore. And that really kind of uh, motivated us to start growing the organization, organization strategically and hiring staff. So we hired a volunteer coordinator, and that's when we, devo we developed this mentorship program. And then the second, um, uh, you know, a tip, uh, you know, something that happened that also made us think a little bit bigger and think about how we can welcome people was when um, uh, our <coughs> vice president Mike Pence. But back then, in 2015, he was the uh, um, governor of Indiana, and he said, well, Indiana doesn't want to welcome any uh, Syrian refugees. Um, and they diverted a family that was due to land in Indianapolis, and they diverted them to Connecticut. And so then our governor uh, also said the same thing, and other governors in other states said, said the same thing, that we don't want to welcome Syrian refugees. And again, we saw a lot of people in Chicago reaching out and saying, how can we help and what can we do? Our little, you know, our website was bombarded with, you know, um, you know, uh, emails, people sending us requests, how can we, we really want to help. And again, we found this community, amazing community of people who are looking to, to support. And again, we, 
started to think, well, how can we accommodate everyone and what can we do to uh, make our services better? And so we now have um, six staff members, I'm happy to say that. Uh, we, uh, in addition to these chapters that we have, so that, that's growing nationally, but locally, uh, we are growing, we have a case management program, we have our mentorship program, uh, we're doing ESL now at our center, so today uh, our ESL class was full, um, it was really, it was nice to see because the first few classes were really difficult to get people to come in, but now we have not only Syrian refugees coming in, we have Iraqi refugees, we have someone from Nigeria, I don't know how they found us, but they, <laughs> they, they, found, our, uh, they found our organization and started attending. We have someone from Mongolia, I mean, imagine, I, I didn't expect that, so uh, it's a a really great feeling and um, we also have some of the Rohingya refugees coming in for some services and um, one of the the highlights of my life actually uh, really uh, was traveling internationally and to serve refugees um, whether it was Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh my husband and I traveled this past November um, uh, to to Bangladesh and to um, I worked I mean I I really didn't have a role because I, I just, you know, I don't speak the language, I can't translate, but I just did photography and, and just ran errands for my husband. <laughs> I was just, just like, go get me bandits, go get me this. I was like, I was happy to do it, it was such an honor. Um, and also uh, traveling to Greece two times to serve the Syrian refugees who are stuck at the border. There, I mean, I have a role because I speak the language, I understand the culture, I can translate, and I also took my children, and they also worked in, in the hospitals, and so that was like, was a great experience to do that as a family and, and to do that on an individual level. So, um, and so I think my faith uh, really guides me to serve the refugee, to welcome the stranger, because this has been ingrained in us since we were young, I think, right? That's the very first stories that we learned on Sunday school or Friday school or where, whenever we went to any kind of school that learned, we went, that taught us about the Prophet, it was about welcoming the refugee and how to do that with grace and honor and helping people resettle with dignity. I think I figured out how to work this one. This is great. I turned it on. Um, uh, our next speaker, and thanks very much. I don't know if you mentioned your husband's a physician. So your husband was a physician going to help the uh, Rohingya refugees uh, in the camp, and you were getting band-aids for, for yeah. that reason. Um, uh, Camille Kodadad is uh, representing the Baha'i Faith. She's an attorney, and she is also the author of the popular column Women at Work, featured in the professional journal uh, Chicago Lawyer. And thanks very much for joining us and talking about the Baha'i Faith. Thank you. First of all, it's, it's a pleasure to be with all of you here this evening. Um, thank you to the Interfaith Understanding Committee for planning this wonderful event. The topic this evening is really an incredible one. After all, one of the main purposes of religion is to promote love and unity among all people and to be the cause of the advancement of civilization. What greater way to do that than to come here together from all of our different faith groups and discuss the critical topic of welcoming the stranger and what we're doing about it and what we can do about it in the future as well. I've been asked to give the Baha'i perspective on welcoming the stranger. Before I begin, I just want to let you know that in the Baha'i faith, we don't have any clergy. So it's each Baha'i's responsibility to read the Baha'i scripture, meditate on their meaning, and come to an understanding as to what they mean. As such, my comments this evening, evening are limited to my own understanding. So to begin with, when talking about welcoming the stranger, I think about who is the stranger? What does that mean? And the stranger can be defined in many different ways. If you look in the dictionary, one of the ways that stranger is defined is a person who is unknown or who we are unacquainted with. But interestingly, another way that the dictionary defines stranger is one who does not belong or is kept from the activities of the group. So when viewed from this individual perspective, the stranger is someone that we've never met, but it also includes those people that we've met, but we think that we cannot understand or we cannot comprehend because they're different from us. Typically, it's somebody that we don't feel comfortable with. And because of that, we label them that dreaded other. They become the other. 
So using this definition of stranger, it includes the immigrant, it includes the refugee, it includes the homeless, the persecuted, the oppressed. It includes people of a different race, religion, social and economic background, anyone who we view as different from, our, the, from ourselves. It could be our neighbor who we feel we can't comprehend because they're of a different race. It can also be the person in another country who is subject to violence and needs to flee their country. And for some reason we think that they're different from us because their situation appears to be different. So in order to adequately discuss the Baha'i perspective on welcoming the stranger, it's important for me to discuss one of the fundamental principles of the Baha'i faith, and that is the oneness of humanity. That despite all of our differing characteristics, whether they're racial or ethnic, we are all underneath the skin members of one human family. And I think this analogy to the human family is really a beautiful one. Because what does a family do ideally? Ideally, the family is a haven for the individual members, and the members take care of each other and are concerned about each other's well-being. So if we truly viewed ourselves as a family, as all of the religious teachings up here instruct us to do, really, there is no stranger. We are all friends, and there is no other. So in discussing this oneness of humanity, uh, Baha'u'llah, who is the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, instructs us how we should treat each other, and he also instructs us how we should treat the stranger. And this is one of the quotes that I've chosen and is in your materials. He says, be a treasure to the poor, an admonisher to the rich, an answerer of the cry of the needy, a preserver of the sanctity of thy pledge. Be unjust to no man, and show meekness to all men. Be as a lamp unto them that walk in the darkness, a joy to the sorrowful, a sea for the thirsty, a haven for the distressed, an upholder and defender of the victim of oppression. Let integrity and uprightness distinguish all thine acts. Be a home for the stranger, a balm to the suffering, a tower of strength for the fugitive, be eyes to the blind and a guiding light unto the feet of the erring. Be an ornament to the countenance of truth, a crown to the brow of, brow of fidelity, a pillar of the temple of righteousness, a breath of the life to the body of mankind, an ensign of the hosts of justice. So in this quote, you see that the Baha'i's perspective is that we should be a home to the stranger. And what does that mean? When I think of home, I feel, I think of a place where I'm unconditionally loved, I am safe, I am accepted for who I am, I am comfortable. And so when we are a home to the stranger, it's not just inviting the stranger to our home and getting to know them. It is that feeling of making the stranger feel at home in our presence so that they feel this love, they feel this understanding, they feel this comfort when they're around us. And this really goes beyond just being polite and cordial. As Dilna has mentioned in her introduction, it goes beyond just being tolerant. While tolerance, of course, is a wonderful thing, we've learned that alone it's not enough. History has taught us that in times of crisis, tolerance evaporates. It does not mean that we are absorbing other communities and requiring to be part of like us, just like us, we are accepting, in welcoming the stranger, we are accepting people for who they are. And we are recognizing the fundamental relatedness of all human beings, despite having any prior knowledge about them. And in speaking about this relatedness, the Baha'i writings state that you are all one family. You have grown out of one root. Each of you is like a branch, a flower, a fruit. You must look on no one as a stranger. You should try to show the greatest love to all men and to every creature. I have come to you as my own people, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. My bond is with all mankind, so should yours be. So what are we doing as a community to address 
welcoming the stranger and it's a, from hearing uh, all of the speakers, so they're doing so many wonderful things. The way the Baha'i uh, faith or the, the members of Baha'i uh, uh, faith address welcoming the strangers, we address it on a local, regional, national, and international level and I think it pretty much flows that way up based on people's individual initiative. And there are really two different paths that I see, two different ways that we address welcoming the stranger. But before I go into those two paths, I'd, I'd ask you to consider this, okay? Would we have the problems that we have in the world with respect to whether it's immigrants or refugees or the issue of poverty if we viewed each other as members of one family? Would we let the person in another country who does not have food or is the subject of violence, would that we let that happen to our child or our brother or our sister? I suspect that we would not and that there is no one in this room that would allow that to happen. So I see that the problem, the things that we are seeing in this world are really a reflection of our failure as a humanity to follow our religious teachings and to recognize each other as family members. So what we try and do as a Baha'i community is address first the problems that arise from that failure to recognize the oneness of humanity by getting involved in our local communities, um, our national communities, in helping the oppressed, helping the refugees, helping the immigrants, um, the Tahara Justice Society, which is a Baha'i-inspired uh, women's advocate group for immigrants and girls. Uh, it changed, made, they were instrumental in changing the laws in the United States so that women who were subject to genital mut female mutilation and, and child marriage were allowed to get refugee status in the United States. You know, similarly, we're involved in activities to provide health care in Africa to address the issue of river blindness, um, uh, gender equality efforts, uh, referred, efforts to uh, address racism against blacks in this country. So, and, in, and not only are we involved in those activities, but we actively work towards uh, changing the laws and promoting laws that recognize the rights of the oppressed. So that's, that's one way that we address it. And the other uh, way that we address it is by trying to also change the consciousness of humanity so that we view ourselves as one human family. And we begin by doing this on a local neighborhood level through children's classes where chil children of all different backgrounds attend, all different races, religions attend, and just are instructed on spiritual principles and the oneness of humanity, or junior youth empowerment classes, which raises the next generation of our world so that they are trained in these fundamental principles we also have study circles that are open to people of all different backgrounds to address the purpose of humankind, how we welcome the stranger, what we do about it. Um, and we also have race amnesty conferences that address the issue of racism against blacks in this country. So these types of activities go on all across the globe. Uh, the Baha'i Faith is the second most widespread religion in the world, second only to Christianity. So hopefully these efforts on a great grassroots starts the you know building block for addressing many of the ills of society, including those that face, unfortunately, immigrants and refugees as well. We want to do some question and answers, and we're going to do some cards. And I'll ask a few questions, and then we'll collect the cards, and uh, we'll bring them up. Although I'm willing to go Phil Donahue, if absolutely necessary. Um, Jennifer, you mentioned the, um, the three executive orders that the president has, has put out there. I think people would be interested to know really what has changed. And everybody says, well, the Trump administration follows the letter of the law and they're deporting more, but we were already deporting 400,000 people a year in the Obama administration. 
what, what does it look like? What's the, what's the thing that is changing now legally that um, we should know about? Yeah, I think. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> <Good> work for me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, the executive orders on interior immigration radically changed the scope for enforcement, um, the priorities for enforcement. Um, so prior to the Trump administration, uh, the Obama administration had really focused um, its priorities for enforcement on um, those who uh, had committed a criminal offense that would present a danger to society. Um, the Trump administration's uh, executive order on January 25th um, expanded the priorities to include um, not just um, those who may have committed a uh, criminal offense um, of a more serious nature, but frankly expanded it to include um, literally almost anything. Um, anything as minor as a, a traffic ticket. Um, the way that the language of the executive order um, is written, um, it, it indicates that um, any chargeable offense um, could make somebody deportable. Um, and that term is left undefined um, and can be, um, it can, can be interpreted by um, some mm. of the, the, the lowest level bureaucrats um, in, uh, in, in the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. So um, the, it also uh, grants power to ICE to determine who might be uh, or present um, a danger um, to national security. Um, again, a term undefined, um, subject to interpretation by an ICE agent as to who might present a threat to national security. And I would just argue when you have uh, terms that are uh, broadly defined in that way, um, that, uh, you know, uh, in, in my personal opinion, um, what I have experienced, uh, not, not, not just in my, my personal opinion, but as an attorney um, at a nonprofit legal aid clinic, <laughs> what I have seen um, is heightened anxiety and fear, as well as um, uh, enforcement um, that has been um, for uh, what I would consider um, relatively minor offenses um, that would not have subjected somebody to deportation in the past. Um, and this has created um, a climate of fear in our communities um, that I think um, is destructive. Um, I've got an interesting question here from the audience. Doesn't climate change and the likelihood of increased, increased displacement of people around the globe make welcoming the stranger all the more important mm -hmm. and likely to grow in importance over time? Uh, obviously, we are getting lessons in uh, internal displacement here with everything from Katrina to uh, Puerto Rico, and we're going to see a mess of it. I, I, um, does anybody feel like uh, I have to say something? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I, I read an article um, in the New York Times about uh, climate change and that in the next 10 years this will be one of the main factors of why people leave their homes. This will be a, you know, a major for displacement. Um, so just to put, kind of put things into context, you know, just for Syrian refugees, uh, we, you have 6 million registered Syrian refugees with the UNHCR, with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. There's about another two or three million who are unregistered, you know, and these are people who have gone into Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, uh, Libya. Um, so six million registered and then another two or three million unregistered in those areas. And then inside of Syria, you have about three million internally displaced people. Uh, so that's half of the population of Syria that's been displaced since 2011. And, and globally, we, uh, we have about 65 million displaced persons um, of those, 20, 22 million are actual refugees, and then the rest are uh, internally displaced or displaced, um, you know, because of either it's weather or uh, wars or conflict or famine or, or whatever the political, um, you know, problem is that's happening in their country. So imagine uh, that we already have this global crisis going on, and then in another 10 years, that we'll, we, if we have water shortages and different, you know, things that are happening uh, due to weather, especially because, like, you know, we had Puerto Rico and. Um, you know, and what happened in, in Texas. My husband went on the mission to Puerto Rico and he said that 
it was a complete disaster. You know, what the president was talking about, oh, it's not so bad, it's not so this, and it's a complete disaster. They have no electricity, no water. Um, the doctors and the nurses were sleeping in like different makeshift apartments without any electricity or air conditioner or anything like that. Um, and it was like 80 degree weather and they could barely function throughout the day to do the missions and to do, you know, to, to care for the people who are sick because they were so tired because it was so hot during the night and, and it was it was diff very difficult circumstances. Uh, but I think Puerto Rico still, um, you know, has not recovered from all of this, you know, from the hurricane. So just imagine another 10 years if we have, you know, climate like this and, you know, what will happen to, the, in addition to the 65 million displaced persons around the world. Um, there's another question here. Uh, the current change in attitude towards immigrants is sadly not just a U.S. thing. It's happening in many countries. Thoughts on why this is? Is it a coincidence that there are also a trends in decreases in people associating with organized religion? And certainly in Europe, I mean, it's plummeted. But um, do, do panelists have any thoughts on this? Why it's happening in other countries too, and like a global. <laughs> I, I think I, I get back to that fundamental principle, which you know seems fairly simple, but I I think we have gotten away from our spiritual principles and the principles of all of our religions, which say you take care of the stranger, you show love, you show kindness, and. Um, it may be partially that people are turning away from religion, but even within their own religions, they're turning away from their teachings. And I think that is the fundamental reason that we, are, we continue to see, and we've always seen racism and discrimination throughout the world, but uh, there seems to have been a recent resurgence of it. To that, um, and I think when people um, started seeing, um, you know, the whole world was watching when many Syrians were getting on boats and drowning in the Mediterranean, and you saw many Syrians uh, take the boats from Turkey into Europe, walking through Europe and going into Germany and Sweden, and um, you know, looking for safety, looking for refuge. And I think the I think the world panicked, thinking that oh my God, you know, people are coming in and in the thousands. And um, and this is when in, in, in 2015 we started hearing this vetting process and you know all of this you know like how do refugees come to the United States? There was all this fear all of a sudden. Thinking people were, thought that okay now the Syrian refugees will be taking boats across the Atlantic to come to the United States. They didn't understand the process of how refugees actually come to the United States. That we have a really strict process. Uh, it takes people two years to get uh, from the time they are contacted uh, by the UNHCR to say, hey, do you want to go to, you know, do you want to resettle in a, in a host country for them to say yes until they actually arrive in the United States. Um, and so people don't understand this. So people were, were, there was this fear that, oh my gosh, the refugees are coming. And the refugees, the, the, of the people that we were seeing were mainly Muslim. So it did, people were connecting refugees and Muslim um, you know, seeing those pictures uh, that are, are coming out of Syria. So really, Syria destabilized, uh, you know, the region and it destabilized Europe. And it led to the Brexit because many people started, you know, talking about, you know, we don't want any, any immigrants or refugees. And it led to us, uh, you know, having uh, this administration be elected because, remember, Donald Trump ran on the idea that, you know, I will not allow Syrian refugees to come here to the United States, and he talked about Syrians and Mexicans. Those were his two uh, main targets, and um, and our vice president certainly was one of the very first um, to say that we don't want to welcome uh, refugees to our state. So yes, I, I'm not trying to focus on just Syrians, but really Syria did affect the whole world of, of how people view refugees. Fear mobilizes politically. All these countries uh, are on the, on the right are getting boosts, all these political parties, they all get boosts by mobilizing by mobilizing fear. And they're not, um, again, they, they probably could use a little more faith, a little less fear. Um, well, I don't think we're going to do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, one of the things I, I wouldn't mind hearing about is um, 
the organization that you work with, um, I, I'm going to mispronounce your name. Where are they? Yeah. I, I saved you the first time. I know. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> Um, the Resurrection Project, say something about the Resurrection Project, because yeah. um, you didn't really say much about yeah. it. Yeah, um, there's two of my colleagues here, so uh, they'll go back and tell my boss. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, so we are a 28-year-old organization in Pilsen. Um, that's where our headquarters are. Our mission is to, uh, uh, sorry, to create relationships and uh, um, agitate people to act on their faith and values. Um, to be able to create healthy communities. Uh, so we do that through three areas. Um, one is through stewardship of community assets. Uh, so that has to do with the physical buildings of our community. So we actually um, uh, have built and own and maintain 600 affordable apartments, um, as well as build and develop uh, early childhood centers that our partners operate um, and things like that. So looking at the physical uh, structures. Um, then we also do what's called community wealth building. And so we believe in that strong families they have to have some strong economics at their home um, and we do that primarily through home ownership and I, so for primarily for Mexican immigrants the best way and really the only way to create intergenerational family wealth is through home ownership and so we have a strong focus on trying to get people to be able to become homeowners everything from starting to think about building credit to the point of being of being homeowners and um, uh, and, and then we have the area of community uh, ownership, which is a community area that I work in. So I oversee all of our immigration efforts, so that includes uh, legal services. So we do naturalization, DACA, um, and as well as uh, U visa petitions, VAWA petitions, and things like that. And so we have a walk-in clinic every Tuesday in Pilsen. Um, and then also our immigrant organizing and education. Uh, so we do a lot of Know Your Rights trainings. We uh, train what we call promotoras, or community navigators for immigrants themselves who go around uh, to schools and churches giving know your rights and trying to stop people's deportations before before they start and helping folks that are going through the deportation process uh, to make sure that they have representation when we go when they have to go to ICE check-ins or when they have to go to court and trying to get the uh, you know letters of support from elected officials and things like that. Uh, so uh, you know, so our mission is to you know build healthy communities, and while um, mainly operating in the areas of Pilsen Little Village, back of the yards in Melrose Park. So uh, we have worked with uh, large Mexican immigrant communities, um, and are starting to figure out ways that we can partner with organizations in other communities so that we don't go out and do some of this work, uh, but that we can replicate some of these models of becoming an organiz of doing organizational work that also strengthens families while protecting them. All right, great. Um, there's a question about Venezuela, and I got to admit, I did a show in Venezuela a couple weeks ago, and I looked at the number of their refugees, and I mean, it's eye popping. They've got 700,000 who just went into uh, Colombia, and a lot more that are going in other directions. It's millions of people. Do any of you work with Venezuelan immigrants? How how are their conflicts unique? Unique? Is anybody? I, I, we're not really seeing Venezuelan immigrants here directly, I mean, I imagine some weeds are coming up, but uh, it's a stunning thing. I, I'm really amazed at um, the numbers there. Um, and obviously, there they are self-inflicting their problems with governance issues, um, and uh, it's it's shocking. I, I think we should all be aware of it, and, and I, I, if anybody knows of any way to help, uh, shout out. Uh, it's, it's interesting. There's another, there's a question about Islam, and, um, and I thought we'd, uh, we'd throw it out there to you. Uh, <laughs> to me? <laughs> there you go. To the person who has declared themselves not, not very religious. Um, but I'll jump in on this if you want. Uh, the, um, explain in simple terms why the divisions of the two uh, Islam two Islams are so divisive and hateful of each other. Why is the Shia-Sunni split uh, a Shia-Sunni split? Um, that's a really complicated question. And, um, <laughs> let's see. Um, I, I'm not, I mean, it goes back historically to many years. I mean, I guess it's similar to many faith groups that have, you know, Catholic, Protestant, even within the Protestant uh, religion, you have Lutheran, you have Episcopalian, you have Presbytery. So, you know, there's always people who will split from the main, I guess, faction or main, main chapter, I don't, I, I'm not sure. Uh, but it goes back to um, a time right after the Prophet's death, 
uh, when uh, the um, his the prophet's companions started um, had differences of opinion who should lead the community after uh, his death, whether it should be his cousin uh, or it should be someone that uh, someone who is old, an elder in the community, and and so that's kind of where the splits happened and. Um, um, I don't know why, I, I can't answer the other reason why people would, uh, you know, they hate each other for so badly, but I think um, throughout history we've seen this, you know, with the War of Roses, with, you know, within the different uh, uh, Christian factions, and we've seen this, you know, all these different splits and the different wars that took, that happened because of uh, these differences, so I, I really don't know what the, what the answer would be historically. And politically, there is a proxy war going on now between Saudi Arabia yes. and Iran that is making things worse all over the place. Definitely. In many, many, many countries that where people were living together peacefully, the war in Iraq did, did, did something terrible too there. Yeah, I think it's more about power and control more than it is about religion at this time because it's who can control the region. Uh, from uh, Iran to the Mediterranean Sea uh, will be the supreme, basically supreme, uh, uh, you know, at, at controlling this uh, area. Uh, otherwise, you know, it, it becomes, you know, about territory and it becomes about, you know, who can lead and who has the superiority over the other. Um, so, I, unfortunately, the Syrian people are the ones who are paying the price. My husband actually last year met with the President uh, Rouhani of Iran last year and he presented him with a letter um, and uh, and he told him if um, if the uh, if your leader the uh, uh, if Prophet Hussein because they believe Prophet Hussein for them is the supreme leader the Prophet Hussein or Hassan I can't I don't know I'm I'm sorry but he said that um, if he was alive uh, would he be with the children of Syria or would he be with the people who are dropping the bombs on the children of Syria. And he, it was a very, you know, everybody was shocked. Everybody, people were surprised that he even walked out <laughs> out of the room. But um, but he really confronted him and he asked, he told him that you have to be with the children of Syria. You have to be with the people uh, of Syria and not with those who are dropping the bombs. Whether, it doesn't matter who, who it is. It's, you know, uh, the, the Syrian children have really paid their price. And what we're seeing now in Ghouta is with the Russian and the, um, uh, so with Russian support, all of the bombs that have been dropped chemical warfare has been used, and it's really unfortunate, and the, and the free world has just been silent. Um, before you drop the microphone, uh, I'll ask you about Syrian refugees coming to the U.S. How many are coming into the U.S. right now, and how many to this area? So in Chicago, we have about 180 families. In San Diego, there's about uh, 260 families, which is over um, this is about close to uh, 1,200 people, and Phoenix, Arizona, there's about 200 families. Michigan um, is uh, also about 220 families. So San Diego is the number one in resettlement of Syrian refugees. Michigan second, Phoenix third, and Chicago is the fourth. Um, uh, there's Atlanta also is a big um, uh, is an area that's also receiving many refugees. At this time, there have there has not been many ref Syrian refugees resettled, but I've heard from a friend of mine who works at IOM. IOM is the International Organization for Migration, which is the organization that um, preps refugees to come to the U.S. Um, and uh, for, so for according to my friend. Those who have passed their uh, tests and their vetting and their uh, process and who have gone through all of the, the, the necessary steps uh, will be boarding a plane very soon because uh, these are people who have been waiting for a very long time to come to the United States. I don't know what the number will be, uh, but she said that uh, there's, uh, there's a significant number coming in from Jordan and from Egypt, uh, but she doesn't know if they're coming to Chicago, but, um, but there's a significant number coming in very soon. Um, is the and the total number of refugees coming in right now? Um, do, you, do you have any idea what what the ballpark number is? It's supposed to be seventy five thousand. It's supposed to be seventy five thousand. Previous we, years were 100. over one hundred. Yeah. And, and so I think it's about 50, yeah, go ahead. And, then we're and only, I, I apologize to my colleagues, but um, so historically we've always resettled 75,000 uh, every year. Uh, the president is the one who sets the number of refugees being resettled and Congress funds the, the program, the refugee program. 
Um, so uh, President Obama, because of the pressure of many faith groups and many people and advocates, in 2015 and 2016, he raised the number to 110,000. And he allocated 10,000 of those uh, specifically for Syrian refugees because there was such a push for that. Um, unfortunately, with this administration, he lowered uh, the, uh, the, the number of uh, annually to 45,000, which is the lowest number uh, sent in, in 50 years, which is really unfortunate. Um, the, right now, we're at the halfway mark of the federal fiscal year. Uh, we're supposed to have resettled at least 23,000 people, but right now we've only resettled about 8,000 people from uh, all over the world. People from the Congo, from Somalia, from Ethiopia, from Iraq, uh, uh, but no, no Syrian refugees. Uh, but um, So we've only re actually resettled 8,000, which is the lowest number. We're, we're not even halfway to the 45,000. And what this has done is has destroyed the resettlement program here in the United States. We have nine resettlement agencies. They're called VOLAGs, um, voluntary agencies. And they're mainly faith-based organizations like Lutheran, Immigrant Services, World Relief, Catholic Charities. And so the, uh, these organizations get paid through the State Department. And they get paid per refugee. And so the fact that you don't have people coming in means these organizations are suffering financially. They've had to let go of staff. They've cut their programs in half. That means that refugees who are here or who will be coming in are not receiving the services that they need and, and the, the help that they need, really. And then many of the, the, the main VOLACs have cut ties with the, net, with the local affiliates here in Chicago. Like in Chicago, we have four affiliates, and you know different cities have affiliates. So the organizations here in Chicago are also struggling uh, very much because of that. And what's really shocking is that we have, you have a religious community, um, especially the uh, evangelical community, that has supported Mike Pence. And um, these organizations are mainly evangelical, like the Lutheran Services, World Relief. These are evangelical organizations that are resettling refugees for, uh, for decades. And these organizations have been destroyed because no refugees have been coming in, and they've had to slash their programs and slash the number of employees. So I just don't, I don't understand why the evangelical community continues to stick with a president that has destroyed a program that is being supported by the evangelical community, that is supported by many faith groups and, and churches and synagogues, and and you know, I, I know uh, Hayes is has uh, filed many lawsuits against the uh, the Trump administration. Good for them. And, and so many of the other resettlement agencies have uh, filed lawsuits, but I, I'm, I'm just shocked at the silence of the evangelical community that has been supporting these organizations where, when the refugee program has been completely, all, almost destroyed. I want to add one. Um, last year, I um, uh, had an effort to um, work through HIAS, which is the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, um, to, to co-sponsor two uh, refugees from Congo, two sisters. Um, it was a wonderful effort, involved the whole congregation, actually led that effort, um, and we were able to welcome them to the United States about five days after uh, Trump signed the uh, travel ban that is now, um, as we all know, embroiled um, in, in uh, our court system. Um, just in the last couple of months, um, the State Department actually canceled its contract with HIAS. So after a hundred years of um, resettling refugees as a Jewish community through the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, um, for the first time ever, um, HIAS will not be resettling refugees, which, um, it, you know, the, it's just, it exemplifies um, uh, the challenges, shall we say, um, to, um, to welcoming the stranger here in our communities. Um, Jira, it's, it's completely frustrating and bizarre to, uh, you know, just someone who looks at it in the news, uh, but do you have some ideas about what faith communities could do? Um, this is kind of the question that we're all trying to figure out. I think that uh, November will be, um, you know, will help us determine whether we can move forward or whether what we've seen happen will continue to happen. Um, so I think the elections are going to become incredibly important. And um, I think usually what happens is we're in the last races like this where we may be represented by folks that are probably good on the issue. And so it's what well, the great thing about faith communities is that they're organized, right? And so being able to reach out to um, folks of the same faith, but perhaps in different areas with different representatives and making sure that they're engaged and voting in November is going to become 
crucial. Um, the other thing is currently, um, you know, we do have a lot of deportations happening, right? We mentioned that there was a lot of deportations during the Obama era, and all, and there was, there was also a lot of those, um, are, uh, the, the way that they count the numbers of deportation is it's also people that are trying to cross um, and are detained at the border and deported, right? And so the reason why sometimes the numbers look a little bit different right now is because there's just not as many people attempting to cross. But the interior enforcement is huge. It's actually up by 22% in Illinois alone. Um, and then there's places like Atlanta where it's up like over 100%. So getting involved in deportation campaigns and being a, and going to ICE hearings and going to uh, courthouses, um, to the court when um, folks have to go in front of a judge, it's really helpful. Sometimes like, I think folks don't understand, like, just the judge seeing the community support there, like they just want to get their jobs done and they see you all as obstacles, so they're like, let's just postpone that person's deportation, right? Uh, so uh, assisting in that is really great as well. Um, and then um, um, and lastly, like in terms of like DACA, um, we, because people have the ability to apply right now, um, and we don't know how long that, that's going to last for. We've been giving out scholarships for folks to be able to cover the fee of the $495 because people are applying and or they're waiting to apply, and we don't know how long the program is going to be around for. And so we do have the uh, scholarships, and that's all through donations. And so we have a website called DACAFund.org, um, and um, that's how we've been able to give, I think as of last week, Friday, we have given over 210 uh, scholarships to folks that need, need that as well. Um, so elections, getting involved in deportation campaigns, and seeing what you can do around DACA to protect the, undo the undocumented youth community. I've got another question about DACA. You know, I, I work on Navy Pier, and the, um, the day that DACA kids signed up for DACA, what was it, seven years ago? I don't know how many years ago it was. But it was amazing. I was so surprised. I, I ride my bike up the bike trail, and there were people standing on the bridge over, in, over the Chicago River, which is way far from Navy Pier, and they were lined up all the way. And it was such a... Um, expression of faith in the system, I thought, because I thought if it was me, <coughs> would I be signing up? I, I don't I, I don't know if I trust the government <laughs> that much. Um, and, 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 they, and people signed up in waves. Um, do any, do people regret that? Or do people want to force the system to do their thing? I, I mean, I, I understand yeah. the willingness to do that, but it's something in my mind was like, oh my gosh. So um, on that line, the night before we, um, I was the guy in the watermelon. Yeah. yeah. So the yeah. so the night before, my little cousins came in and they were gonna go and uh, they were gonna go in the morning and apply. And then I got an email saying that there was already a hundred people and this was like 9 p.m. So I was like, grab blankets, I'm taking you, um, because I wasn't gonna apply that day because I actually had a flight the next morning. And um, we got there at 10 p.m. and we realized that there was already people there and luckily Navy Pier was gonna let us start having people wait inside. Um, so I started forming the line and I stayed till three in the morning when I have to get home to take a shower and go to the airport. And but my brother came and relieved me and then he formed the rest of that line. Um, so the, no, I think, um, it's different types of risk. Being undocumented and having no social security number, no work authorization, no uh, no protection from deportation is more risky than giving the government your information, right? Um, and uh, and so I think that that's why, like, it's our reality is that we don't have anything, and having something is better than having nothing. Um, so I think it's, it's for a lot of folks it is difficult to say like to understand why we would give this information over but it was only through giving our information over that we were going to have an opportunity to actually be able to work and for a lot of us we were coming of age and thinking that we need to actually we need to support ourselves we need to get jobs right and so this was the way to do it and it's the exact same thing that you're that we saw with driver's licenses a lot of folks were like well if the state of Illinois were to provide TBDLs um, right or temporary visitor's driver's license which is a driver's license is that undocumented people can get in Illinois would they apply right because they're giving in their information over to the to the government um, 300,000 people have their driver's licenses in Illinois because being undocumented and having nothing is so much more of a risk than giving your information over thank you I'm sorry <laughs> about this broken system thank you. and we're gonna um, have a few words uh, from Camille's mom, who's here, and uh, her, she is one of the understanding
Committee for the Nutrier Multi-Faith Alliance. She's Dr. Gina Kadam Kodadad, and uh, she's a scientist, educator, author, uh, professor emeritus at Rush Medical School. Thank you. Cool. Where do you want to stand? <laughs> Which microphone do you want to use? You can use this one. I can use this one. I'll switch chairs with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the committee of this alliance, um, I want to express our appreciation first to Rabbi um, Heaps for those inspiring words that opened our session and also to the moderator, Jerome, who is the uh, who with this program, WEC. And we also want to thank him for making mention of this, actually inter interviewing some of the panelists on this program and hence enhancing the interest in this event, this theme. Our immense appreciation goes to our accomplished panelists and engaging panelists, Jennifer Gong Gyorjovis, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Even though I'm reading, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Erendira Rendon, Susan Ahras Sahlul, and Camille Kodelad for their insightful contributions toward enhancing awareness and increased understanding of this pressing and weighty concern of our times. That is, they were guided by the sacred text of the respective faiths, the Jewish, the Christian, the Muslim, and the Baha'i faith. Each came to us with knowledge and experience and also dedicated service in the field. And hence, I personally feel that I have gained a greater appreciation of the implications of these issues. Just because you shared with us your experiences, there were facets of this I had not been aware of. So again, thank you many times over and over again. I also want to thank the Interfaith Understanding Committee who's put a lot of time, care, and diligence in organizing this event. And the Vinetka Community House for making this setting, this beautiful room, historic and celebrated room, available for our venue. But foremost, indeed foremost, I want to thank you all for your presence here, your interest in this theme, You've heard various dimensions of it. Some were directly political and some were not. And so uh, I think we need to continue on meditating on this important point of the stranger and consider what is it that we can do. Maybe together move on so that, so that uh, there is no stranger and each stranger may find in us a friend a haven, a refuge. And this is really, I see it in that fashion, that goal. I want to share with you now this ins inspiration from Baha'i writings. When you meet a stranger say, yonder is coming to me a letter sent me by God. If we could open the envelope of life that comes before us and look within the envelope and learn to read the writing we would find in every human soul which crosses our threshold a message from God. And if we could understand the message, it would be God's benediction to us. To look within that envelope and be able to read what that message is, that each stranger, each refugee, each displaced person brings to us. And for that, we would be much richer. I want to close with a few verses of a prayer from the Baha'i sacred scriptures. O thou provider, assist thou these noble friends to win thy good pleasure and make them well-wishers of stranger and friend alike. Bring them into the world that abideth forever, 
Grant them a portion of heavenly grace. Make them signs and tokens of the kingdom, luminous stars above the horizon of this nether life. Make them to be a comfort and a solace to humankind and servants to the peace of the world. Thou art the mighty, the powerful, and thou art the God of strength, the omnipotent, the all-seeing. I invite you to enjoy the refreshments in the back and then to continue on conversing with the panelists and with one another on this very important issue. And when you go home, please do a lot of soul searching in what we in, as individuals can do in order to promote friendship among all peoples of the world, in particular those strangers who cross the threshold and come to us. Thank you to all, all of you.